My name is Sabah Tahir, and I am the author of An Ember in the Ashes, the series, and co-collaborator on the Ember graphic novel, which is called A Thief Among the Trees. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and it is kind of cloudy outside, but I really want it to rain, and it probably won't. This is my office. It is my um, happy place. <laughs> I have fan art on the walls, and I have, um, you know, just art people have given me that readers have given me. And of course, I have a nice cozy rug because I'm South Asian and we love rugs. <laughs> um, and um, it is uh, where I come to every day. It's a private office. So during COVID, it's been a real sanctuary, a place for me to come um, every day to work. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, A Sky Beyond the Storm, which is the fourth book in the Ember Quartet. Um, but I'm also going to talk about the series as a whole. So if you haven't read the series. I'm not going to spoil the earlier books, so hopefully you'll still be able to enjoy the talk. Um, the Ember take series takes place in a Roman-inspired empire, and it's about a girl named Laia. She's a lower-class citizen um, who is fighting to rescue her brother, Darren, um, from imprisonment. It is also about an empire soldier. His name is Elias, and he's training um, at a military academy, and he wants to be free of everything that the empire and this academy is forcing him uh, to do. Um, so the book was inspired by my work as a copy editor at the Washington Post. Um, I read stories after story after story about child soldiers and genocide. Um, I read about extrajudicial jailings um, and sectarian violence, and all of those things really ended up in the Ember Quartet, um, along with more recent events like the refugee crisis in, in Europe. So it's on its all against a fantasy backdrop. So the series is four books. Um, the second one is called uh, A Torch Against the Night. Um, I definitely have a, a fire theme going on. Um, and Torch adds a viewpoint, and that is the viewpoint of a character named Helene Aquila. She, um, she is Elias's best friend from the Academy, and um, Helene is meant to be very much a counterpoint to Laia and Elias. So, so Laia starts the series as very frightened, um, you know, very, very cowardly, and she sort of finds her courage over time. Whereas Helene starts off quite brave um, and, you know, very intimidating. And yet she is this uh, morally gray character. And, um, you know, she's, she's a colonizer, she's an oppressor, um, and she believes deeply in the empire and its very flawed mission. So, um, and that's really only because she hasn't had a chance to think about it. So over the course of the series, we see her examine and interrogate that way of thinking. Um, the third book is uh, called A Reaper at the Gates, um, and that introduces a fourth point of view. Um, it appears much more rarely, but it was actually my favorite point of view to write, and that is the point of view of a character called the Nightbringer. Um, um, the mythology of Ember's world was based off of um, uh, stories that, that I was told when I was young. I'm from Pakistan. Um, they're stories of jinn, effort schools. It's stories that you'll find across South Asia um, and the Middle East and North Africa. So the Nightbringer is, is a jinn, and it's very easy to see him as the villain of the series. And he is, he is the villain of the series. Um, there's another villain named the Commandant, um, and they're in cahoots. Um, but writing The Nightbringer's point of view allowed me to kind of get into his head and see how he sees himself as a hero. And that was very educational. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the book that um, is coming out in December of 2020, and that is The Sky Beyond the Storm. And Sky is the culmination of um, these three books and this, this series. It's the culmination of 13 years of work. It took me a couple of years to write. And I started working on it in the spring of 2018. Um, and it follows these characters through the final phase of their journey and their growth. So Laia has really found her courage, but she's lost her trust in other people. Um, Elias has found freedom in some ways, but has changed in other ways. And Helene is coming face to face with the reality of what it means to support a government um, that does very terrible things. So, um, and the Nightbringer, meanwhile, is, is out for vengeance, you know, like you do when you're a villain. Um, however, um, vengeance has a price. And this book is very much about his history, his memory, and whether um, vengeance is, is worth the price that's demanded of him. When um, I was in my early 20s, <laughs> I was writing a book and it was a book, it was like a memoir. And I called my mom up because I was like, this is not going well. I'm having such a hard time. And she's like, well, you know, you're like 21. You probably don't have that much to write about. Um, so she, she suggested I write a fantasy novel. And so that was one part of my 
inspiration for writing Ember. So there's the work I did at the Washington Post. There's my mom saying, hey, go write a fantasy novel. But my favorite part of the inspiration story for Ember is um, that I was working late at the Washington Post one night. Um, I always used to work, you know, get home between like 1130 and 2 a.m. So this was one night where I, I finished work. I got home very late and there was a huge storm in D.C. It was thundering and raining. It was sort of one of those classic D.C. summer storms. And um, I got into my home, which was a walkout basement at the time. And as I looked out the windows, I saw two red eyes staring at me through the storm. And I was like, that's a gin. And I ran and hid in my room because um, it was a gin. I didn't know it might get me. So um, I'd been raised with sort of this, this mythology and these stories that, you know, gin loves storms and, you know, they like to walk near trees. And so um, that, that night I kind of got this idea of a gin walking in a storm. Um, and that's, that's those three elements are really what inspired An Ember in the Ashes. The concept of American ingenuity to me um, means a few different things. First, I have to ask myself, what does it mean to be American? Um, to me, to be American is to hold many things inside you at, at one time. Um, to understand that the, the principles this country was founded on, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are noble and beautiful things, but the implementation and the execution of those principles has not always been noble and beautiful. Um, and as a result, America is very much a work in progress. It is, um, it is a story that's still being told. And so, you know, we're, we're all part of that story. Um, America is sort of only in, as ingenious as, as we are. Uh, we're the heroes of this country's story. And the thing about stories and the thing about being a hero in the story is that it's not always wonderful. It's not always easy. The hero of a story gets frustrated. They get hopeless. Um, they, they are lost sometimes. They don't know what to do. And when that happens, you look to the other heroes around you, the people who are also part of your story and of the American story, and you find inspiration from them and you tell yourself, I'm going to fight with these heroes and I'm going to stand up with these heroes and I'm going to contribute my own tiny story to the vast story um, that that is America. Um, you know, and, 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 that, and my story is going to be one of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, but also one of hopefully fairness and justness and making sure that all voices are heard. Um, so that, you know, even if those, those, those concepts were not always, as I said, carried out or executed fairly or justly, um, we can change that. We have the opportunity to right that wrong because history is, is, is constant um, and, and we can make a better history. So to me, that is sort of the heart of American uh, ingenuity is this idea of us all being part of that story and making that history stronger and better than ever with our own, with our own stories. Telling your own story um, is very intimidating. Um, telling any story is intimidating, but I would say as somebody who has tried to tell multiple stories and then ended up telling, telling this one, telling the story of Ember, um, you have to start. Um, you have to, to decide that you're going to do it. So that's thing number one. And then to me, I think it's just really important to ask the what if question start with just a single concept. So, you know, an example that I have is let's start in a nursery. It's a plant nursery. Okay. What if the plant nursery is owned by um, a single dad? And what if the single dad is in deep in debt? And what if being deep in debt, he decided to take out a loan from the loan shark? But what if the loan shark is like, you owe me money and now I'm going to break your kneecaps because you haven't paid it back. But then what if our single dad, our, our, our business owner, realizes that he has something on the loan chart that he can hold over his head and now we have a little war between them? Really all I'm doing is asking what if questions. So if you have a story that you want to write, take a simple concept and start asking those what if questions. And it can be about your own life, which can sort of, you can ask these questions and take it into fiction. Um, or it can be, you know, it can be nonfiction. You can write, be writing about someone else or about yourself. And you can still be asking those what if questions of yourself. Um, you know, what if I had done this instead of that? I think starting from that place allows you to really find the story in, in, in anything. Recently, I collaborated with Boom Studios, um, Nicole Andelfinger and Sonia Liao to create an Ember graphic novel prequel. So this takes place before the events of An Ember in the Ashes. It's called A Thief Among the Trees. Um, and 
I created the story and Nicole created the script for the story. And then Sonia created the art for the story. There was also a colorist. Um, there was a letterist. And it was an incredible experience because I had never worked with a team in that way before um, where I was sort of, you know, looking at the script and also looking at the art. And, you know, we were talking about how to make, you know, a certain feeling rise up from the art or, or how to how to get the script exactly right. So I learned so much from the process and it really made me realize two things. One, I really actually enjoy working in a team. I didn't I didn't know that. Um, and and two, that sometimes telling a story through a different format allows you to focus on things that you don't get a chance to do in in the prose um, prose version of the story. So in the case of A Thief Among the Trees, um, I really learned a lot about dialogue um, and, and scripting and sort of how to let dialogue tell the story as opposed to having all the exposition that you often have in, um, in, in, a, in a prose, you know, a regular fiction book. I have not used the Library of Congress in my work yet. That is going to change. <laughs> um, libraries played a huge part in my life. So this is one of those sort of classic like uh, hero's journey <laughs> stories. When I was in seventh grade, I was, I didn't fit in and I was getting bullied. Um, and so I would go hide in the library every single day at lunch for like a few months. Um, and I don't remember the librarian's name. I just remember a little bit of what she looked like. And I remember that I used to walk in and she would just have a new book waiting for me. It would be sitting on the desk and we wouldn't exchange words. I think she knew I didn't really want to talk. <laughs> I just wanted a safe place to like eat my lunch and like read my book. And so um, I would walk in and, you know, when I finished a book, I would turn it in and she would just have a new one waiting and I would grab my book and I would eat my lunch and I would, I would read my book. And occasionally a friend would come with me, um, you know, another kid who, who I think was struggling at the time. We're actually still friends. <laughs> um, but the library was a, a safe haven. It was a sanctuary for me. And I think it is a sanctuary for so many children. And I think that librarians are, you know, they're confidants and they are friends to so many children. Um, uh, because sometimes you don't feel like you can go to your teachers and you don't feel like you can go to your princi uh, principal, but there's something about a library that's magical and has all this possibility and this sort of feeling that um, while you can go on adventures in a library, no one's necessarily going to come get you and, and, and harm you in a library, like you're safe there. So those two things combined kind of make for the perfect place to me. So um, I love libraries. I think they're amazing. And thanks, if that librarian is out there watching, thank you, you saved me from real misery in seventh grade. <laughs> if you are reading my book for the first time and you want a music recommendation, um, please check the acknowledgement section of my book. It has little lists of songs that inspired me or that were major inspirations for each book. Um, and then you, if you're like really intrigued and you're like, wow, that music was great, then you can actually go on to my website, um, which is trickily enough, sabatahir.com. And there is a music section and you will find many, many playlists there. Um, I love music. It is my home. Um, I think it's just the best thing ever. If I wasn't a writer, I would probably be something in music. I don't know what, not a singer though, because I have a terrible voice. Um, um, but music is, is a huge part of my writing experience. So I would love if you would go and check out some of the songs that I use to inspire me. Thank you guys so much for, for watching and participating in this very sort of different um, National Book Festival. If you are a writer, um, read, dream, write, um, and just get something on the page, anything on the page, because you can always make it better later. That's what I tell myself when I'm struggling to write. I'm like, I can fix it later.